Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at the streets of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time, and thank you for joining us on this another episode. We welcome you who are watching on a video version through our two uh, video podcast players through YouTube and also uh, on our uh, Facebook channel. We also welcome those who are listening to the audio version of this podcast wherever you catch your favorite audio podcasts. And uh, just as an FYI, if you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, Amazon just picked up the Latter Gay Stories podcast. So we are part of the Amazon Prime podcast family now in, his, uh, in addition to Apple, Google, iHeartMedia and all the other podcast players. So if you aren't into the podcast world and don't know where to catch episodes like this, there are, there are uh, podcast players everywhere and we are on all the major ones. So if you just search them, search Latter Gay Stories, you'll be able to find this episode and others available everywhere. Welcome, Jake. Thanks. And welcome to the studio. I'm excited to be able to um, share your story and have this discussion because we're going to take some deep dives into a lot of different topics. So for those of you who are watching and uh, unsure of what to expect, we're going to talk about coming out um, multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of church uh, trauma, uh, which I think we should probably give a little bit of a trigger warning because we'll have some discussions about some, some pretty intense um, traumatic experiences that you uh, found through Mormonism. Um, and I think that will play well into those who aren't uh, Latter-day Saints, who have never been Mormon, who also follow this channel, who can recognize what traditional Orthodox conservative religions, high demand religions will do uh, to individuals in the margins. And we'll discuss that. We're also going to have a discussion about uh, sexual assault yes. and um, another trigger warning there. So we're going to discuss church office buildings, Jeff Holland, um, Eric Hawkins, we're going to discuss uh, a lot in this episode about um, this intersection. I, I mean, even hate saying intersection, this clash between mm -hmm. Mormonism and sexuality. It kind of felt like a war. A w I think that's a great way of putting it, mm -hmm. a war. Uh, so that's part of um, Jake's episode. Buckle up, hold on. This next hour or so is going to be uh, exciting and, and hopefully informative. Awesome. So Jake, um, where do we start? At what point do we... At what point did Jake realize I'm different? I think I realized I was different at six and it wasn't really like sexuality based. It was just, I was different than the rest of the boys my age. Um, I definitely had a lot more girlfriends growing up. Uh, all the neighbor girls were, you know, my friend. Um, I, as I got older, I kind of just wondered, am I supposed to be different sex like am I supposed to be a woman and it didn't make sense to me because I mean I didn't ever think I should be but I always had those questions and then um at about age 11 I, I definitely could define it and say I am gay um, and it kind of centered around bullying from people at school people at church and then my brother himself Interesting that you say um, in your younger years you thought that you might be a woman. Was that because you sensed inside of yourself effeminate traits, or were people on the fringes pointing that out to you? I think that I did notice like effeminate traits, and even just like hobbies that I was interested in seemed a little bit more feminine than the boys my age. So I did, I really loved crocheting, and I learned that from my grandfather and then my grandmother. Um, but that's not a thing that a boy does. And then when I was seven or eight, I did tap dance and ballet because from Sesame Street, I, I saw this like tap dancing number and I was like, I really want to do that. That looks like a lot of fun. That that's interesting to me, but just being in tap dance and ballet, I really got that. You're not normal as a boy kind of feeling. And I wanted to do more of it, but I just dropped it. Was that those feelings of you're not normal? Was that coming from you, like inside of yourself, or was that coming from actual people, your family, your friends? I don't know if I've ever really dived into that for myself. I just feel like it may have come from social norms and what I saw. And, you know, boys play with G.I. Joe, they play baseball, they're into football. And then for me, it was none of those things. None of those kept my attention. Let's talk about your family life. Uh, you grew up in Texas. Yes. 
Um, you also uh, were raised in a family of Latter-day Saints. So okay. what, let's talk about your family life. What was family life like um, for a little closeted gay boy? Um, so being around 11 is when I could really define it and say this is, this is a thing. And to have parents that were available to ask questions, they kind of weren't. They worked uh, full time, both of them. Uh, Dad had moved to Texas from Washington State where he was trying to start his new job, the Blockbuster. Um, and then after the school year, we would join him. So he was not there for 11 to 12. And, that, and then also 13 because... I started as a deacon at 12 in Washington. Um, and then my mom hurt her back at some point during that year, and she was bedridden for three or four months. And so he would come back around that time that I had discovered everything, and um, it was probably every other weekend. And I don't know if I had a lot of interaction with him when he came back, because he kind of just left my mom to take care of us, and she kind of couldn't. And a lot of those responsibilities fell on my brother at that time. Um, we'd go to church every Wednesday, every Sunday. And it was kind of hard for my mom. And some days we just, some Sundays we wouldn't even go. She'd find people to pick us up for Wednesday night activities. And it was just kind of during that initial phase of finding out who I was, they weren't around. Did you ever find or contemplate within your own self that maybe your sexuality was a burden? And that you, especially given all of those things you just talked about with your family structure and the things that were happening, that there were other bigger fish to fry in your family and you didn't want to burden the family with an additional issue? I didn't probably feel that way until later in my teens. I think I think I was a late bloomer when it came to like really discovering sexuality for myself. Um, and I don't know why that was or if I just didn't have time to think about it, but... I do realize, like, pornography became an issue um, at 11, 12, 13. And then it kind of went away when we moved. And then I, every so often, it became a problem again. Define what uh, that means by an issue. I'm curious what you see that as an issue. I don't know if I did, like, as now seeing this as an issue, but that is where I learned more about what sexuality looked like for me. And that the feelings that I had were very much in line with what I was seeing, but I couldn't ask anybody, not church members, not church leaders, not family, because I was scared to. What was it that you were scared most about? Them finding out. Your secret? Yeah. Um, finding out that, w which was worse, uh, and this is like completely hypothetical, but which was worse, finding out that you were gay or finding out that you were looking at pornography as a Mormon? I don't think... I mean, when I came out at 17, they finally put the pornography issue together. But I don't know. Like for me, like coming out as gay was a bigger problem. And I just wanted to hide that for as long as possible. And I remember at 11, because I knew enough to you know, search the scriptures. And I searched, and I could only find one verse that even mentioned anything. And I just, it didn't make sense to me. One yeah. verse that mentioned being what? gay, like being or gay. homosexuality, mm -hmm. that it, that it was you know a sin, or that it was wrong, and there's all all these other verses on murder and and different types of things that you're just like, I don't know why, from going to church that I'm receiving this being gay is equivalent to similar acts, or or, or whatever. When you were um, just growing up in your household. And especially within um, your time, I would say as a deacon, 12, 13, uh, into teacher, 14, 15 uh, year old age, growing up in Mormonism. Do you remember any harsh teachings? Do you remember any teachings surrounding this topic coming at, from the kitchen table or even from the pulpit or in a Sunday school class? I remember, and it's not like distinct, but I remember receiving them as harsh. Um, and I, it, it ranged from sacrament talks to Sunday school to general conference talks to um, 
like FHEs that we would go to, like as a youth activity. So if um, maybe I'll back up before I ask yeah. that question. But I'm so like I how do how does how do teachings like that, especially within the church, especially with, from your family, that seem negative. You haven't used the word negative, but I I am assuming a lot of the teachings that you received felt negative yeah. or felt um, like they were indicting you. Um, how how do you move forward in a healthy way, or did you, or were you able to move forward in a healthy way? I I don't know if I moved forward in a healthy way because when sixteen hit, like dating was like every, all the kids my age kind of was exciting. And I wasn't allowed to. And so I kind of found other means to to f- f- figure that out, I guess. Um, I, can, I think I just kind of, with around those teachings, I just ignored them until they became a bigger problem. And that seems to be a theme that I followed through life until it became a bigger problem, then I addressed it. So you were like the typical Book of Mormon musical. You put it in a box. Turn it off. You turned it off. Mm-hmm. You smashed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, high school. So um, you said that you weren't able to date. Was it that you didn't choose to date women? Did you date girls in high school? Or did you know enough about your own sexuality that you weren't going to put yourself in those positions? I don't. So I remember having like little crushes on girls like in high school. And I don't know if I felt like it was genuine, like I want to date them or if it was just like want to be their friend kind of thing. Um, but I never really had the desire to date them. Never really wanted to touch them, hold hands, kiss them. It was just I knew my emotions around you know men and men my own age that I was more attracted to. I think you're now wandering into territory that becomes super familiar with people who have lived on the closeted side of the aisle. Um, if you're if you aren't finding these uh, places where you can be Jake mm-hmm. and you can be yourself, we typically start finding other places uh, of acceptance. Is that true of your story? Very much so. How so? Um, I remember at age 16, and this is going to be kind of funny for people watching, but MySpace, you could find uh, gender, sexuality, um, and age of anybody in your area. And so I was able to find somebody that lived pretty darn close to me. And I added him on MySpace and started messaging. And then we moved to AOL Instant Messenger. And pretty soon we had our, our own first date, probably months after meeting on MySpace. But but that was that was how I decided to go about figuring out like what does dating look like for me 16 years old Mm -hmm. on myspace which for those of you who are um uh, young (laughs) myspace was the precursor to uh what we kind of know as facebook today it was one of the really first online social experiments that were out there that it was i even actually still have my old myspace account i can still pull it up i lost the password and the email address to recover it um, but it is the jankiest little um, website looking thing but it was it was our way of connecting with other humans it was but you're 16 yeah um, you uh, have found uh, was older guy younger guy same age I couldn't tell you how much older he was although that I think he was at least 10 years older than me at least did you ever felt like feel like it was predatory or was there a connection there um, I think, I'm just curious how I don't think on his part it was predatory um, I just didn't think anything of it like it was a guy he's interested in me he's attractive why not and you had your first date yeah what was that like it was fun uh, we went to see a movie um, I can remember the the movie it was, it was Aeon Flux I remember him trying to like hold my hand and I allowed it and um, I went to his house to pick him up in my car. We went to the movie and I came back and at his house, he just, you know, invited me in, um, sat on the couch for a little bit, kind of talked. And then the next thing I know is moving into some territory that wasn't comfortable for me. 
And that's where I got my first gay kiss and a little bit more. Is this the part of the interview that we venture into the world of sexual assault? Is it started there, yes. Um, he led me back into his bedroom and we continued. And that was my first sexual experience. So I had all my gay awakening right there, all, all in one, one night. This is, there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I want to be sensitive. I also want to be educational mm -hmm. um, because there's, there are a variety of people who will listen to this episode. Um, and I want to try to understand how important um, this topic is to those who are closeted and navigating their world. Those who are dating um, newly out men. Um, I also think there are a variety of uh, parents who could learn something from um, this situation. And I also want to be sensitive to those who are uh, victims of sexual assault and the real pain that is associated with that abuse. Walk us through whatever you want to talk about um, in terms of, and I don't want to say that any part of the sexual assault was beneficial, mm -hmm. but uh, parts of those experiences that were beneficial to you, but also what would you want the audience to know about that experience? I think for the fact that I had a sexual experience and was underprepared for it as a 16 year old, um, was difficult. And that was probably where a lot of the assault may have come from, from, in my opinion, that was the negative piece of it is like, I just didn't know what I was going through or what to have expected. Um, I think, I, I mean, I reverted back and it was probably another year before I really got, I wanted to try anything more, but it was like the, having gone like far enough to have broken the law of chastity in LDS terms um, was scary to me. Um, but I think from that experience, like a positive was understanding that I one was comfortable touching and being um, loved by another man um, was important to me to, to figure that out. Um, and that I did like kissing and, and that was, that was okay for me. In the earlier part of the interview, you said that there was a, a two coming out experiences mm -hmm. and one of them happened um, around this age. So I'm curious if this, um, obviously a traumatic experience likely meant that you had this conversation with parents or another leader and that m was the impetus for the coming out? The coming out was actually based off of a, a friend. Um, so we were on the swim team together. He had come out to his parents. Um, we were 17 at the time. Um, and he didn't have a good experience with it. So his, his dad was a, a police officer, very conservative, didn't really understand, like being Texas too, like we didn't, a little bit more to the coming out, being gay kind of thing was a little bit more difficult um, than probably any other state um, that I could think of. Um, but he came out and I, I, I saw him tackling things, uh, making progress, being able to find a relationship that he loved and was a part of and he could grow in and coming out for me meant the same thing. So right after junior prom night, it was also Mother's Day the next day. And I, I, I had already told friends at high, in high school, like I'm gay, I'm ready to come out. I don't know how, like how much, I definitely want to tell my parents. Um, and the girl that I went, went to prom with that night, she's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm just really nervous because I'm going to tell my parents tomorrow. Um, and then the next morning, my mom was like, are you okay? Like, you look sick. You look physically ill. And I said, I need to tell you something. And she's like, what is it? I said, I'm gay. And she's just, she's sitting on the couch and I'm on the floor behind or in front of her. Um, and she looks up from the couch and my dad's taking care of the dog out back. And she's, and he's, she says, Darren, did you hear what your son just said? And he goes, no, what? Because he just admitted to being gay. 
and that was so th that was a Sunday morning and the next thing is uh, I'll go talk to the bishop or whatever I'll, I'll I'll talk to the bishop we'll figure it out we'll we'll find out what we can do this is you saying you'll go talk to the bishop mm -hmm. or is this your mom this is me um and I remember my dad asking a whole bunch of questions like you well, first, I, I know him saying, like, if you make this choice, your family will not accept you. You will not be loved by your grandparents and your aunts and uncles. Like, it just won't happen. Um, and that scared me to death. And I'd already seen my friend who had just lost pretty much his whole family. So being scared in that sense, I thought my dad was going to kick me out. Um, so I was, I mean, I was willing to do whatever to, to still be supported by my parents Chronology wise, uh, this coming out, was it prior to your sexual assault or after? It was after. So you did, did you tell your parents about that experience at all? They actually didn't know until earlier this year. A 34 year old man finally telling his parents, I was sexually assaulted at two different ages. And my dad was shocked. He didn't, he didn't know what to say. First, you came out to your mom on a Mother's Day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not that that's... Here's your gift, Mom. Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Mom, for <laughs> yeah, your it's... years of dedicated service. Right. <laughs> uh, but freeing, that had to have had some level of uh, some chains that were broken from you, some ability for you to move forward. I don't think that that, in my case, was a thing. I didn't think that there was chains that were broken until the second time I came out. It took 10 additional years for me to go through whatever I needed to and be able to say, this is still a problem. It's never changed for me. Um, I need to figure it out. Let's talk about um, those 10 years. Um, what was the problem and what didn't change? Um, I don't know if it's a problem now. I'm pretty much at peace with it, but being gay was the problem. And there was just really no way to balance it with the church life that I had. Um, so I went to, I never served a mission. I never felt like being gay and serving a mission was an, a good thing for me. Um, it would have caused a lot of anxiety and depression and um, a nerve. And I probably would have been one to come home early. Um, so I went to BYU Idaho instead. Um, I, got, I graduated early from high school, um, got into a scholarship program at BYU, Idaho, and then I spent a year there trying to figure out life as a gay Mormon at a very religious, high demand for marriage type school. And everything, all the activities were based around like, you go and you meet a girl and you guys start dating and you get married. And being there for a year and realizing, like, I just wasn't making that happen. And by the time I had come home, I was just too stressed to want to go back. So I remember taking a year, year and a half off of school. And um, I did not want to go back. There was no way. So I researched, you know, what other credits do I need? I only needed two more classes to my associates and, and get out. Got those classes, got my associates and then did my bachelor somewhere else. But in that, in that year and a half, like I didn't want to go to church, and I didn't. Um, a friend reactivated me um, to go back, and it wasn't a negative experience in my opinion. Like I really had fun. I built community, I made friends. Um, I served in callings that I loved. Um, I really grew like a deep appreciation for the gospel and doctrine. Um, and I, I probably served as, I served as an Elderscorn president for three and a half years, two and a half years, sorry, during that time. And being Elderscorn president in a YSA ward or branch, they kind of have this like six months and you'll get married. And they were like, we don't know why you're still, you know, Elderscorn president, but we like you. You're doing, you're doing a really good job. And so, I don't know, I got tired. I got burnt out of doing that. And once I, stopped being Elderscorn president, I kind of took a step back and was like, what does my life look like now? I'm not dating any girls. Um, 
I'm fairly lonely and I don't know how to fix it for myself. And so I was probably 25. Um, and I went back to the family ward that I grew up in just because I didn't want to be a part of a dating, dating ward or branch. Um, and at some point I just started, let's get on Tinder. Let's, let's meet guys and let's figure out this dating thing. So just to recap, you, you come out at 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, you tell your parents it wasn't the best experience there. Um, and I mean, especially in terms of acceptance, Mm -hmm. um, through kind of your, your family circle, but you do, you did what often a Latter-day Saint men in your situation will do. And that's you go back into the closet and double down on the church Mm -hmm. and you give it all. Now you did say you didn't serve a mission, Mm -hmm. um, because personally for you, that wasn't it, but you jump back into those righteous church services, the callings, the ability to go in, likely serving in the temple. You were trying to fulfill all those roles and callings necessary to distract yourself, to get over this uh, elephant that still existed existed in yeah. the room. Yeah. I thought if I was doubling down and I was reading my scriptures and praying and temple work, I'd, I'd either find answers for myself or it wouldn't be a problem anymore. What do you say to those Latter-day Saints who listen to uh, that portion of the story and say, you were doing all the right things, Jake, but you just weren't trying hard enough. You, if you would have just done it a little differently, those answers would have come. Um, I know for myself, it probably would have destroyed me. I had already had suicidal thoughts of that, you know, at that point of it just wasn't working anymore. And... I remember, I think it was after I came back out the second time, my parents had gone to a family reunion here in Utah, and my mom was distraught that I was alone. She was fearful that I would, you know, commit suicide. And even my first tattoo is a meaning that says, keep moving forward, because at some point, like, I needed to. And I don't know, I don't know. I didn't commit suicide, but that really was a big thing for me. And when we get to that point of that breaking and we don't feel, we're tired of pain, that becomes the next option. Do you feel like it was the church that contributed pain? Was it internalized homophobia that contributed pain? Was it not being able to be authentic that contributed to that pain? I think all of it was contributing to it. Um, something I just learned late in life, um, being diagnosed with ADHD, there's a lot, it kind of magnifies the feelings that you kind of already have. Um, And so I felt rejected of my family, of my community, uh, as church community. Um, That kind of contributed to a lot of the pain that I felt. And then I think being held promises, like you can have a family, you can have kids, but never being able to fulfill those. And so, like, earlier on in my journey, like, after I came out the first time, I did the church family services, um, and I met with a counselor for four times. Um, And he showed me videos of, like, these are men that have been gay, and they've been able to have full lives with women and have kids. Um, So, you you know, instilled that hope. And that was right before I went to BYU-Idaho for a a year. So I had that hope and, and dashed. Um, for those uh, audience members that aren't familiar, you say uh, LDS Family Services. This is a social service program that was administered. Um, it's uh, it's a church uh, organization. It's a group of church therapists or those who are Latter Day Saint therapists um, who meet with and counsel people through under therapeutical guidelines and specialties um, with the slant or with a focus of uh, Latter-day Saint doctrine. Um, And typically, uh, bishops who often are well-meaning or stake presidents, which are congregational leaders in Mormonism, who often do mean well, will refer um, queer Latter-day Saint members of their congregations to these therapists. 
And it wasn't up until, it was uh, in 2021. So all the way up until 2021, these therapists were pushing change therapies, reparative therapy ideas that, um, it w my point is it wasn't until 2021 when the church finally said, LDS Family Services no longer supports conversion therapy. We no longer will, uh, will uh, associate ourselves with therapists who push that type of ideology. But um, likely, which is the point I wanted to get to in this interview, is that you were taught um, and counseled through these therapeutical sessions that uh, what you were experiencing was changeable, that there were manageable, there were ways to manage your situation and ways to allow you as a queer Latter-day Saint, as a queer Mormon, to marry a woman, to have kids and move on with your life by distracting yourself. Yep. And it worked. Yeah, I'm married. No, not at all. Um, I mean, like I said before, like it just, I gave up. Like I couldn't even touch a girl when I went on dates in my, in my early 20s, let alone think I could marry her. I could feel comfortable saying, I want to have kids with you. And then the time where 25, 26, where I went on dates and started seeing guys again, uh, it just... It clicked. Yeah, it so we sense. yeah we left this tangent, um, or we started this tangent on uh, Tinder, mm -hmm. um, and which I believe this is the the genesis to your second coming out. Yes, um, you finally realize that all of this is kind of the the clinical definition of, uh, of insanity. You've tried something over and over and over again, still receiving the same result. Therefore, it's time to try something different. And it was leaning into the very measure of your creation. It was mm -hmm. um, now exploring that side of yourself, maybe with more healthy boundaries. No, not really. Because <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what, I mean, dating in the LDS arena was you meet at church and you go on dates. Usually you start with group dates and then you go to, you know, individual dates. But for me, it was you start talking with somebody on the internet and you kind of click a little bit, you go on a date and you don't really know much about them. You don't know what to expect. You've never seen them in a church arena. You've never seen them dis display values, um, never built trust, loyalty. It's just you go out and you do. I think you also bring up another side point that it's uh, important to talk about. There is no place um, or structure within Mormonism to allow our queer youth the opportunity to learn how to be affectionate, to learn how to date, to learn how to have these meaningful relationships because those are restricted only for straight couples. Hmm. Such a disadvantage you find yourself in. It, it, it is. And I, later on in life, kind of going through, because I feel like, when I hit my genesis for second coming out, it was also the church was starting to learn more about and be supportive of LGBTQ individuals. Um, and so it kind of gave me a lot of hope that maybe someday like dating for me would be better or be easier and that even the church itself would accept us in that arena. Let's talk about the details of your second coming out. Um, was it done in private where you, like you said, you decided to download Tinder and decided to start um, exploring? Um, or did you bring your family in uh, along that ride? Um, I definitely went out on my own again just because the safety issue of family. I didn't understand where they were at with stuff. And so I just kind of took the opportunity to figure it out myself before I got to that point of saying, Mom, Dad, this is this is still a problem. And that's that's where it started to hit, is I, I said at 27, I talked to them first and did um, some counseling with a LDS therapist again. But this was an amazing therapist. He had a very, very good grasp of what LGBTQ looks like and what the church uh, direction could be. And so he was like, I think your next step is let's do a full-fledged coming out. I think you're ready for it. I think you're confident and you're comfortable with it. Let's do it. Um, and so I did. I eventually was just a little bit more authentic with myself. The posts on Facebook changed a little bit to be a little bit more LGBTQ, like, given insight. And people just kind of got the hint. 
what does a full-fledged uh, Jake Shepard coming out look like? I'm, I'm interested in the details <laughs> of that. Um, I think eventually I did the the typical like Facebook post of, hey, you're, I'm gay, and this is this is who I am. Um, I couldn't remember the details around it, but I know I did it. And that was finally to the point of everybody kind of knows, and it's just not a big deal to me anymore. Did you uh, do what all the other uh, internet gays do, and did you bleach your hair? Oh, yeah, but that was COVID. That was just a whole different issue. <laughs> I was bored. <laughs> I, you can always, I just always say, you know the stage of gay by the color of the hair. If it's bleached, <laughs> uh, it's crisis time. Yeah, that's probably, that makes sense about COVID time. <laughs> Okay, I didn't want to detract, but I did. That was funny to me. I think like full fledged coming out kind of also came with taking back some of the things that I didn't think that I could do. Some of those were like piercings and tattoos and coffee, and then maybe even a little bit of like learning what wine is like and being able to say, like, I'm not a part of this as much as I used to be and that I can find finally find out who I am outside of this religious like concept. So your coming out was less about um, the importance of having people know your sexuality. The second coming out was your ability to um, have an Abrahamic moment, your ability to find out who Jake was. Yeah. Th this ability to say, um, I don't even know who I am. And in order for me to find out who I am, I have to start looking for him. Mm -hmm. I have to start exploring. Absolutely. All the ingredients that make up. Absolutely. And it came with its own little trauma cycles as I, you know, did one thing and it caused me anxiety. And I, you know, fishtailed back and did another thing and that caused me also anxiety. And it just was back and forth until the breadth of it was narrowed. What did you find along that journey? I'm, I'm curious, um, wh was it beneficial to you? Um, oh yeah, for sure. Um, it was it, the last five, six, seven years have been the, the best few years of my life. Um, there's been a lot of heartache, but it hasn't come without rewards. Um, I think just knowing that me, my, 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 at my core, I love safety and security. Um, that was one of the things that was crucial about like why I love the church is it promised safety and security. But when I learned for myself that I can provide that and not worry about it anymore, coming from a religious standpoint, then things just kind of changed. And I afforded myself more opportunities to find out the things that I like, the things who I am, um, things that scared me because it's a sin or it's going to cause addiction or it's going to be a problem. Um, I realized they're not, they're not those things for me. Um, it just took a lot of, you know, going back and forth and fine tuning and finding what felt right. And what is, what is Jake? I want to talk about the tale of two communities um, because kind of interwoven in your story thus far is the, uh, this dichotomy between the religious um, faith affirming side of your story. And we should probably also discuss North Star and mm -hmm. that aspect of your story as well. So th those who want you to carry the religious uh, um, mantra with you, this, this religious weight with you, in relation to your coming out, you have that community. Um, and then you also have a newfound community, which is the queer community that you're becoming um, actively involved with and getting to know and better understand. Uh, was there a fight uh, between those two? And what did you learn of those two communities as you navigated this? I feel like there definitely was a fight. Um, the North Star mentality uh, that I had come to be familiar with was, in, particularly for my own case, was you stay celibate. You don't act on anything. Um, there had been an ideology that kind of surfaced through some of the, the chat forums or whatever, which was a celibate relationship. Um, and that didn't really become of interest to me until after my first boyfriend. Um, and then 
But when I moved out here, I had built community through North Star, but I knew it wasn't my landing zone. I knew it wasn't the community for me. And so after my um, first breakup with a boy my boyfriend, um, I found a different community that just accepted me wholeheartedly. They provided areas that were safe, that were um, had room for everybody, whether you're religious, spiritual, agnostic, um, didn't want anything to do with any of those things. It was just a great community. Um, and it was hard for me to balance that because what I had been taught was these external communities are not safe. And so I was very reluctant, very slow to like hop into it. But th that was the community that I learned I thrived in more than anything. Yeah, so I, I think that's super important, and it's candid and it's honest, and I think we hope the audience picks up. So you have you have your religious bishop, church community, um, your parents, who also, uh, in many Latter Day Saint traditions, they they recognize the value of this celestial bond that they don't want the family to be destroyed or broken or severed into any pieces. So parents will often do whatever it's, it takes necessary to keep the family together. And then there's even this, this um, niche group of Latter-day Saints who have created uh, forums, and you talked about them, one being North Star, mm -hmm. uh, which is an online faith-affirming uh, group that promotes celibacy, um, often mixed orientation marriages, as a remedy to navigating world, this world as a uh, queer, bisexual, gay, lesbian, and often a, a transgender Latter-day Saint in this uh, space. So they've created these faith affirming uh, solutions to yeah. uh, homosexuality or, or uh, gender incongruence. And as in my case and your case and the case of so many other people who find themselves uh, at the threshold, this doorstep of North Star, we didn't stay very long, mm -hmm. um, often because that message wasn't sustainable. It was faith affirming and it was hopeful and it was full of faith, uh, but it lacked reality, it lacked substance, and it lacked real-world examples of people who actually thrived under those rules. Yeah. And I, my experience with North Star was I saw five to six marriages fail within the first six months that I was living here of just friends that I had become friends with. And that was one evidence that was like, this is not a sustainable model. Who chose, and, and just to clarify, these were gay men who chose to marry women um, or were already married to women, and it just didn't work. Correct. And so it was not evidentiary, like in a sustainable thing for me. Yeah, and I, I, wanted, I just really want to hammer that point home. Like, we, we literally are talking about organizations that exist today in 2023 who are encouraging gay men to marry straight women as an alternative or as a remedy to, to overcome or at least shadow their sexual orientation. And at some point in my life, I figured out I'm never going to put a woman through that. There's no way I could, I could have, I mean, it's worked for some and I'm, I know your case and, but you have great kids from it. And, but I just didn't think that I could split a marriage and, feel comfortable with it and then have kids involved. So for me, it was like not, a, not what I want to try to go for. And then, yeah, so we, we, the, again, I opened this little segment with the tell of two communities. You have that community, this, mm -hmm. uh, this religious side of the community that says, Jake, you've just got to hold on to the rod a little bit stronger. You've got to do more. You've got to be better. You, um, you just haven't tried everything. The Spencer Kimball, um, mantra to this, but yet now you're finding communities of people who not only are supportive, but are allowing you to have the very things that you sought for in Mormonism mm -hmm. and it isn't Mormonism. Correct. You're able to find authenticity and honesty and being able to thrive on your, uh, living in, uh, according to your own values and morals that are still good. Yeah. How, how, how do you explain that to the religious right? That says, that's not possible, Jake. I don't know how you explain it. Cause I mean, hate, I hate to throw this out there, but the, the talk from last year, which was the Holland's musket fire, I just disagreed with it immediately. And it was atrocious that even in 
the form that he decided to, to say those things, I don't believe that, you know, that we deserve to be hunted down like that. And then right after that, you have real Brad Wilcox saying, where will you go? What will your life look like? What will your symphony be? Will it be just chopsticks on a piano or will it be, you know, Chopin? And so hearing both those two things, like it was just, I don't like, there's so much more out there. There's so much to be able to experience life to its fullest, to have been raised in a, a family affirming, like they want you to have a family kind of situation. But the family that I want does not match what their intentions are for me. And so to go to that next community, the one that does want that for me, that was freeing. That was where my chains fell. That's where my weight was lifted. All my burdens that I felt like should be burdened, like helped by the members, they weren't. They were, it was the other community that really picked me up. I get the sense that along this journey, you experienced uh, some internalized homophobia. This inability to um, grasp and embrace uh, this aspect of who and what you were. What did that second community do to help you overcome that? I think just having confidence, like that what I wanted, a very value-based life still, um, but to have that family, I don't want to throw my life in anybody's face. I actually want to sit at home with a husband, with raising kids, and just be as quiet as possible. We take our kids to school, we, let, we raise them, but we don't want to throw our, our life in anybody's face. And like that's what that community understands. They love that for us. They, they champion us for, for that. I want to get to the part of the interview um, where we discuss as you walk away from Mormonism, as you distance yourself from the rigidity of those teachings, how there seemed to be, um, or in a very real sense, a witch hunt to find you and to uh, expose you and a then partner mm -hmm. um, to church discipline. Um, so... I met my partner through same community, but he was still a little on the fence of, am I staying in the church? Do I want a partner? Do I want? And so we met February, 2019. We started dating, um, end of April of that year. Um, and then we just probably around the closer, end of that we became more serious and and decided to talk about like what do our goals look like um and I, I because of the trauma around sexual assault and my dating experience here when I got to Utah was I did not want to have sex it was very much in a very asexual like I don't want to have it at all and that's trauma based it's not like I was born this way or like I just know that I didn't want it um, and so for safety and security, one of the things that's important to me, that relationship really felt like it was a good thing for me. And it would have been a good thing for him as well. Um, we had plans to move in eventually. We wanted to make sure that we had our temple recommends. So we were both, um, we, didn't have, we were worthy of law chastity at the time. Um, and then... He had just gotten his temple recommend renewed uh, through his bishop. Um, and then I was in the process of working with my bishop in my, my home stake and ward. And it started in October of 2019. I met with him. I said, hey, I'm gay. I have a partner. Um, we don't have ill intentions. We don't want to make any disruption within our wards or your ward. We just want to be able to say, hey, we're dating we have temple recommends. We want to be able to go and like serve um, like any other member could. Um, and then November, I talked to him about, hey, can I do priesthood duties? 
Is that something that you feel comfortable with me doing? And he met with me in my home with his first counselor at the time. And he turned to his first counselor and said, hey, what, like, what do you think about this? Do you think he should be able to do priesthood duties? And the first counselor said, yeah, he's got the right intention. Um, he doesn't have anything ill will towards anything. And the bishop had asked, like, do you guys plan to move in together? And he said, not right now. It'll be a long time before we get there. And just by circumstance, my partner got kicked out of his, his actual permit. And so that expedited things. And by the end of January 2022, or 2020, sorry, um, he was planning to move in with me. Um, and I had already had the stake president interview for my recommend, where we went through all the questions. And um, it was actually with my bishop. And he said, we're not going to give you your recommend. And I said, well, why not? I said, because you have plans to move in with your partner. And I said, I haven't moved in with a partner. Like, that hasn't happened yet. Um, and then I said, can you just sign this piece of it for me? And then I can go talk to the stake president about it. So scheduled the stake president interview. And same thing. He said, because you guys plan to live together, we will not give it to you. And there was a lot of fight, I guess, in that meeting. We probably met longer than any Temple Recommend interview should. And he threw out name dropping. He threw out North Star connections. He threw out, um, he threw the handbook at me, which in my opinion didn't really stick um, because we weren't living together. So the cohabitation guideline at the time was what he was going with. Um, he just He just wouldn't give it to me. And so he said, meet with me in three months, and we'll see, we'll see what happens. But by that time, my partner had moved in. Uh, it had been a month since my partner was with me that um, my bishop and stake president caught wind of it. And it's just because we sat by each other in, in Sunday uh, sacrament. And uh, he called my partner, um, because he had just moved his records and so he had his contact information and said, you're not allowed to do anything with the priesthood. And then that was a private conversation, so I don't know all the details, but the next thing was two or three hours later, he got another call from the bishop and said, I've already talked to the stake president. You're also not allowed to have your recommend anymore. We've already canceled it and you won't be getting that back. And so my partner decided to stay like with me and kind of work through it and see if we could put put up a a case for us to to not have been treated that way. Um, it was March time frame of 2020. So we're in the heart of COVID. Yeah, just started. Um, and I found connections uh, for reaching out to Elder Holland and. Um, both, we both wrote letters, both citing why we felt like our relationship wasn't inappropriate or wrong or that we were disallowed temple recommends or priesthood duties. And um, it was several weeks, but he, I mean, he set up us to meet with the Area 70 and somebody with, uh, somebody who wrote the handbook. I could not remember names, but so we met with them. It was June of that, of that year. Um, and they said, give us two to three weeks. We'll talk to your state president. We'll talk to your bishop. We'll make sure everything's right. If you do not hear from us within four, four to six weeks, like reach out to us. And this is, we had just gotten in, in deep with like grad school. He started his and I started mine. So we both got really busy. In that fall, I reached out to his secretary because they never reached out to us. Never heard anything from the stake president. And so I just said, hey, like, where is, our, where is this at? Where, where are we at? Are we allowed to go back to church? Are we, are we comfortable being there, like, doing priesthood duties? And I had, we didn't hear anything. And um, went through the next semester of school. Um, 
and that was just the that was the real true test of our relationship is like we just kind of realized that we weren't doing the right thing in the, in the sense of like for both of us and so our our relationship felt kind of fell apart we had already started to try to reach out to Tom Christopherson at that point and help get our case moving but by that time it was it was too late and so once Tom got involved we we just it was became an individualist type scenario I just want to make sure the audience um, we we kind of follow this chronology because we we started into um, uh, you sharing this experience with this dichotomy between two worlds where you had this religious side and then your explorative side mm -hmm. this part of you that was just trying to lean into the full measure of your creation mm -hmm. who and what you are in almost all circumstances that usually leads people out of the church and they abandon Mormonism completely. Mm -hmm. uh, but in your case, you chose to stick with uh, the church and stay there so much so that um, you maintain an active temple recommend, mm -hmm. yeah. which means paying tithing, you're attending, attending church services. You are morally clean. Yep. You're, uh, you're abiding by the church's rules of the law of chastity. Yep. And um, in the middle of that, uh, adventure um you, not only are you doing all those things but you also are dating and th this may throw a lot of people through the loop saying well see you already were breaking the law of chastity or you mm -hmm. already were uh disrupting um, the church's method um, yeah. and their rules but you you're not the only person that's out there doing something like this no. um, there are a variety of other latter-day saints some of them are very uh uh forefront and famous. Um, I think first and foremost of Charlie Bird, mm -hmm. who is doing something exactly um, as you just described, who also maintains a temple recommend, who holds priesthood callings, who has a boyfriend um, and doesn't seem to have this uh, reality of meeting with apostles um, in order to save that temple recommend. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of preface that just as a um, just to contrast um, the realities of Bishop Roulette or Leadership Roulette, where some Latter-day Saints, um, and we can say based on their Deseret Book book deals, um, their ability to um, move a message on social media, how their situations, and I should even say even while at BYU, uh, as a student at BYU, um, their situations are overlooked while others are not. And I think that presents a uh, problem for Latter-day Saints in the way that they mitigate um, their rules in this space. Mm. That being said, you appeal to um, uh, this chain of, uh, of apostles and you hear nothing back. Correct. And so much so that it's almost as if Mormonism wins because they didn't want you to f get into a relationship. They didn't want you to move in together and now the strain of of this uh, of this process of appeal got so tense um, that it separated you and your partner yeah and it was almost as if mormonism won that they they were able to get the outcome that they wanted the whole time yeah i i kind of related to really religious abuse in a way the neglect that we felt for your ish time frame where we just didn't know where we, we stood with the church. And I think that that was actually, my thought was is it's, you know, they did not want us to prove that we could be valiant um, gay members in a relationship because we're just going to fail. Um, I, I mean, that's kind of a shame, but I, I, that's what I felt like they, they tried to do. Um, and, I, and, and a little so of it, like, is like my stake president actually worked for the church. And so because of one, his job is kind of on the line. Um, if what happens in his stake happens, um, that we prove, you know, that we can be valiant, then what does that do for his job? What does that do for him? And so I think that that's where the, the stake president roulette and bishop roulette came in was they felt, he felt he had the opportunity to impress his power as a church uh, employee to 
do something in our in our situation. And just to be clear, this isn't he wasn't a run of the mill church employee. He was part of the church's PR firm. Correct. Uh, not even the PR. He was he is the voice of Mormonism when it comes to these topics in the media. So th this was a big deal. It was. Um, and I think just having that be enough, like, it just really pushes power on us. Where do you go from here? Um, you have, throughout this whole story, um, it seems like as much as you try to um, be the very best Latter-day Saint you can be, and as much as you try to lean into um, navigating both worlds mm -hmm. so often in this space, especially those LGBTQ allies who remain um, active Latter-day Saints, they say you don't need to choose between the two. You can be gay and Mormon and it's fine um, that there is a, there's a path for you. We've heard that from Elder Ballard. We've heard that from Elder Holland. We've heard that from Elder Cook. We've heard that from Elder Rasband. We've heard that from the church over and over and over again, that there is a place for you in the kingdom. There is a place for you in the church. Jake, is there a place for you in Mormonism? Has there, have you been able to find that place in Mormonism that allows you to thrive? Absolutely not. And unfortunately, I feel like after that scenario is they just don't want us there. And then I, I can pull evidence out that says, you know, this is, this is how they feel about us. They really don't want us there. Um, and so like being able to realize that and come to know that, like I, I left very quietly at the time and was okay with it because that wasn't my place anymore. Um, I think they kind of gaslight with those talks that say there's a place for you, but I don't really think that they feel that. I don't think that they want to prove that. One of the things I know is if you are showing action, that is, that tops what people are saying. And I have never seen the complete follow through on action when it comes to you belong here. What does the future look like for you? You've navigated yourself away from Mormonism. Um, you are trying to better understand who and what you are navigating this world forward. What does that future look like? And what advice do you begin to give others who are just stepping foot on this path? Ah, uh, I think my, my future looks the same as always looked It's like, I still want that family that I've, I wanted. Um, I love like seeing people as kids and like babies even I'm like, I cannot wait to be your father. I cannot wait to have kids of my own. That's, that's the dream that has never changed. I don't want to change the way of how I date either. I want it to be very value-based and very strong. And like, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to do the, the hookup apps that are out there. I want to meet people and I want to make genuine connections. Ones that want to have that family and that are healthy enough to do it for me. But the advice that I would give is like, if you don't feel like you fit, then it's probably a, there's it's probably there for a reason. And I wouldn't hesitate to try to figure out why you don't fit. I've never asked this question before, I don't think, um, on the podcast. Um, but what is your advice to other um, uh, value-based queer men um, who are navigating this world just like you are in a very similar space where um, you want to hold on to uh, certain core beliefs. Mm -hmm. Where do you find um, other men like that? Or what is your advice to those who may listen to this podcast episode and say, I'm the anomaly. I'm the only one out there that wants that. Um, how, how do you meet your herd? How do you find other men like that? <sighs> That's a good question. I'm not even really sure. I, um, I, one, just you know, got a date. It's going to take sifting through a whole bunch of crappy dates to figure out if there's any guys that are similar to what you want. Um, just be involved. Like, there's got to be somebody out there. We're not, we're not an anomaly, not by any means, but it's going to be harder to find groups like that. And I think 
and it's, it's kind of unfortunate because I feel like there's a self-fulfilling prophecy is if you leave the church, you end up going to a community of sex, drugs, you know, alcohol, all that. But I don't feel like I had to and that I wanted to. I feel like I can still be the introverted self of like staying home on Friday nights, not going out clubbing, not getting plastered, not trying all sorts of different drugs. Like I can just be who I was before. Um, one of the things like I learned hard is mistakes happen and you can't always be perfect, but if, as long as you give yourself that compassion, you can still follow what, what you think is right for you. I think that's really sound advice. Yeah. And, and I think it's, uh, it's advice that we don't often hear, um, because it's not the most popular and prevailing message, uh, that's out there in this space. And I've said this over and over again. There's more than one way to gay. Uh, there are uh, there as 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 often as I say there's more than one way to gay. I also say there are, are as many plans of salvation as there are people out there. Mm-hmm. And and I think that that's true. That there are a wide variety of of ways to navigate this this topic and this journey. And all of those are valid and and okay because they are the this is the journey. This yeah. is this is the path that we're on for this very reason. Um, I, I appreciate stories like yours because it, it gives the audience and those who feel like the anomaly, those who feel like the cipher in the snow, the only one out there, um, hope that they're not alone. And if anything, I've always wanted this podcast to be that space where people recognize and realize that they aren't alone, they're not broken, and that their best days really are ahead. Yeah. That you have that opportunity to thrive and survive. Um, without sacrificing your values and morals yeah, and being authentically you. Because of what we've been taught, that's kind of, it was kind of hard for me to come to that, but I eventually got there. I feel like, like me as I am now is the most me I've ever been. And I think that, I think you, that you, that allows you to show up as your whole self. Mm-hmm. That allows you to show up a hundred percent you. Mm-hmm. And who wouldn't want that in a partner? Who wouldn't want that in a friend? Yeah. Who, who wouldn't want that in their own personal life to say, you get all of me, you get et- what warts and all, you see everything. Yeah. That to me is authentic, authenticity and honesty. Yeah, absolutely. What haven't we talked about in this episode that you wanted to cover? I think we covered most of it. Just the you know, deconstructing and trauma and sexual assault. And I think one of the things that really drives me is like, I want to be more open about when I'm teaching my own kids, like what are some of the dangers you'll see? I want to give them the opportunities of learning about things that I didn't have opportunities to learn about and be more open and, and free to talk. Um, I think that those are the spaces that really help create better, like resilient people. As Jake has shown up um, for the world in his true self, um, I'm curious, kind of as we wrap this podcast, uh, what your relationship is like with your family now? Um, it's good. Uh, I've still always been close with my mom uh, and, and dad. Um, I put up boundaries between members that don't really have the space to listen to me and say, hey, like, I want to know about your situation where you're at instead of just hearing from the grapevine of where I'm at and, and assuming things. But grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody else has been amazing, accepting. And it's, I think we've hit a place in not just church, but society that we can start accepting better and more freely. And my family is proof of that. I'll take it. I think if anything, I want, uh, podcast episode, uh, episodes like this to show um, that there is progress and that we are uh, doing this um, often with a blindfold. This is like the bird box <laughs> sometimes, but uh, we, we do this with the intent of, of making this path a little less rocky um, for those behind us. And um, ultimately, my goal is to reduce the amount of triage necessary to help people become happy and healthy. And, and give them the opportunity to thrive on their own two feet. And once I've, I found over and over and over again, once you're able to stand up on your own two feet, secure that on a, your own oxygen mask, and and 
finally feel confident on your own, uh, we make much better decisions. And we were able to navigate this path in a much healthier way uh, when we do it um, with pure intent, with uh, informed consent, and with the ability to make those decisions rationally. Definitely. Thanks again, Jake, for stopping by. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks Thanks for being vulnerable and, and sharing some things that aren't uh, uh, easily discussed, um, that are candid, um, but yet honest and, and part of your journey, journey um, that I do believe help other people. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. And we thank you, uh, the audience, for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this experience. If you have a question for Jake, if you have a comment about this interview, we invite you, if you are watching on a video version of the podcast episode, to share that in the comment section. And I will uh, ask Jake, you're social media friendly, you'll respond. Yep. yep. Um, so he can jump on um, Facebook or YouTube channels as well and answer your questions. If you are listening on the uh, audio version of the podcast as well, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and uh, help follow along uh, to this and other episodes. If you do want to contact Jake, again, he is uh, on social media and we'll have um, those social media contacts through our Facebook and uh, YouTube channels as well. We're also, um, ha we have episodes like this and uh, can, uh, additional information on our Instagram pages uh, TikTok and all the fun social medias. So wherever, wherever you find your social media fix, we're there. And we invite you to subscribe and connect with our channels that way. Most importantly, we're just thankful that you're giving us uh, an opportunity to share these stories. And, and by um, listening, hopefully you better understand these experiences. Because it's stories like mine, it's stories like yours, and it's stories like Jake's that help us each continue writing our own latter gay story.